welcome our guest, Dr. Seth Bordenstein. Um, he's joining us today from Vanderbilt University, where he's a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, it's really cool to see so many faces from different departments here at CSU, and this really speaks to the broad scope and impact of the work that Dr. Bordenstein has been engaged in over the past 20 years. Um, so the Bordenstein lab has been investigating the complex and dynamic interactions among animals, microbes, and bacteriophages, and the importance of how these interactions can affect host fitness and the trajectory of evolution. Um, at, Dr. <laughs> at Vanderbilt, Dr. Bordenstein is the Centennial Endowed Chair in Biological Sciences. He's also the Director of the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative. He's the Associate Director of the Vanderbilt Institute for Infection, Immunology, and Inflammation. He's also an active member in many other programs and areas of research at Vanderbilt, including chemical biology, genetics, diabetes research, digestive disease research. Um, he was also recently elected to the American Academy of Microbiology as well. So we're really glad to have you here. You've done a lot of awesome things. Um, he's also been the recipient of many awards for his research and scholarship and his teaching. And I did the math on this. I could be a little oh, off, no. but I think like in the last five years, he's secured over $5 million in grants and funding just in the last five years alone. So nice job. Um, Thank you. So he's published over 106 peer reviewed articles. Uh, his research has led to, has a lot of applications. And right now he's got five patents pending that have to do with using um, his research, the things that he's gained from his research to control, mostly vector control, like m controlling mosquitoes, but there's five patents pending. So this science is very applicable to real world problems. Um, he teaches introductory biology, microbiology, and an undergraduate seminar at Vanderbilt. Um, he does other little teaching things here and there, but those are the main three that he's doing right now. Um, so the, the Bornstein Lab is also involved in science outreach to middle and high school students throughout Middle Tennessee, where they have an integrative lab series called Discover the Microbes Within, and it uses Wolbachia like as the study organism and helps students to get some hands-on science experience and trying to get people interested and excited about research. Um, so I wanna point out that this all sounds really wow and big and like Seth is doing all these great things, but there are a lot of undergraduates in the audience today. And so I wanna point out that this all began when Seth was doing undergraduate research on Wolbachia at the University of Rochester. Um, his first publication was actually on work that he started as an undergrad. So get involved early, definitely. Um, so he's continued to pay it forward with by mentoring um, many successful graduate and undergraduate students at Vanderbilt. 15 of those 106 publications were actually authored by undergrads. And the Bordenstein Lab is always seeking new lab members. So um, that's all I'm going to say, because you're here to hear Dr. Bordenstein talk about his research. So I will just let him go ahead and get started. Um, as we move, if you have move forward, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And then when we're done, I will go through the chat and bring the questions to Dr. Bordenstein's attention. Okay. Thank you, Abby. That was a wonderfully thorough present uh, presentation <laughs> of my record. You've read all the pages in the CV, and that's the first time anybody's ever done that. So I appreciate oh, yeah. it. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about one of the main research topics in our lab. We, we study a number of things in the realm of host microbe interactions, including the most intimate symbioses uh, between insects and their bacterial symbionts, uh, as well as uh, facultative symbioses that involve host microbiome community interactions. Uh, a bit of which we're going to cover today in, in, both, in both topics and in one system, uh, these parasitoid wasps known as Nasonia. And you can see there are some males and females crawling around this puparium fly host. Uh, this is the stage at which the wasp will lay their eggs inside the puparium. Uh, those eggs, probably about 40 of them, will develop into larvae and will consume the inside of the fly uh, until it's basically gone and just you have this puparium shell. 
And over the course of a couple of weeks, the wasp will develop into adults, emerge back out and start the life cycle again. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about some concepts, definitions and frameworks to start off the talk. And then we'll get more data heavy towards the end. Um, so stay with me on both parts and hopefully we'll, we'll learn something. So the first part I wanna talk about is obviously there has been an increasing recognition of host microbiome interactions and complexities across fauna and flora uh, in the last decade, in largely part due to the sequencing revolutions and the discoveries from the microbiome sequencing. And many terms have been thrown around to characterize this new appreciation of the complexity of the microbiome associated with hosts beyond just simple endosymbionts, there's a complex consortia of microbes. So we have the cover of Science News saying I ecosystem. We have books entitled The Human Superorganism. Uh, and we also have the development of new terms that have been somewhat debated about their utility. And I just wanna clarify how I think they're useful and how others are using them too. Uh, so a holobiont is strictly a structural term to reflect the complexity of the host and its entire microbiome, including transient, stable, uh, helpful and harmful microbes spanning the gamut. Um, and then the whole genome is just the integrated or collective unit of all the genomes of the microbiome and the host together. Um, so as structural terms, these are relatively new and developing. Uh, there has been uh, an original use of these terms as early as 1991, and we start to get the citation indexes using them in 1992 with some exponential growth in, in the recent decade because of the microbiome science is driving the complexity and discovery of these microbiomes in various hosts. Um, in addition, there are now conferences that are tied together between the Symbiosis Society and the Holobiont uh, uh, theme. There are Earth Hologenome Initiatives and there is a Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics. So a lot is developing right now around these terms and how, how they're ultimately going to be used and appreciated in the future. I think the most useful way of thinking about them is structural terms. Just as we have a holoenzyme to define an enzyme uh, and its metal cofactors, for example, um, we have a holobiont, which is the host in its microbial community. And then the genomes would be the hologenome. So in that framework, I'll be using those terms for, uh, for this talk. And I think I'll just go a little deeper in, in sort of juxtaposing the individual Nisonia versus the Nisonia holobiont. Um, for anybody that studies symbiosis or the microbiome, I think this is pretty conventional to think about um, the host microbe ecosystem. But the term itself frames a concept and framework for, I think, non-symbiosis folks that helps us get their lens on symbioses and host microbiome interactions in a deeper way. So juxtaposed against each other, the individual, of course, has its nuclear genome and a mitochondrial genome for this particular Nisonia animal. In the hologenome case, we have multiple species um, composed of multiple genomes from those species, and therefore that collective unit uh, is called the hologenome. Uh, on the individual side, of course, there's vertical transmission of DNA from mothers and parents to their offspring. There's also horizontal gene transfer on occasion, and then there's recombination mixing genes up as well. And on a conceptual side, all of those things are happening in the hologenome, including in addition to horizontal microbial transmission. And I think you can model actually the dynamics of a holobiont and its horizontal microbial transmission much in the same light as you could model how recombination in the individual genome breaks apart gene associations. Um, horizontal transmission of microbes breaks apart host microbe associations. So there's a nice conceptual continuum there that I particularly like for a more integrative biology. There are deleterious and beneficial alleles. There are deleterious and beneficial microbes on the other side. On the individual side, there are intragenomic interactions and that they can be conf in conflict or cooperation. That is genes competing against each other or genes collaborating with each other. And on the hologenome side, you can have intergenomic interactions. This would just be, for example, hosts and microbes competing or collaborating with each other. Again, I think there's a nice integrative concept there. Uh, on the host side, the individual side, multiple levels of selection can operate on genes, on chromosomes, on whole genomes, et cetera. Uh, and you can also have neutral evolution. And on the hologenome side, you can have multi-level selection. And that can be theoretically modeled as a multi-locus or network system. And there can be neutral changes in terms of host microbe changes happening over time. 
So there's a lot there to chew on and we could talk about it later, but that tends to be why I like these terms and why, um, why others are using them. It just offers a more integrative view of the host microbiome system. All right, getting to the content of the talk today, I wanna to go back to the luminary of speciation, which is of course, Charles Darwin, uh, who in 1859 writes The Origin of Species. And many evolutionary biologists like to note that the origin of species could have been titled The Origin of Adaptations. And that's because why Darwin focused a chapter on hybridization, um, he didn't provide actually a species concept. Uh, the biological species of concept, of course, comes many, uh, many decades later. Um, and he struggled with the idea of where does a species begin and where does it end? And in fact, he has this quote in the book more to make the point than to reflect his confusion. But he wrote, why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being as we see them well-defined? And that's because he thought about natural selection and adaptation driving new continuous varieties over the course of evolution. So why is an evolution just this continuum? Why, don't, why do we have species that kind of break that continuum? And he had some answers to that, certainly, but by and large, the field of speciation developed much later um, once tasked with this challenge of what Darwin laid out. So I would say that the first time people started thinking about host microbiome associations and speciation um, dates back farther than I anticipated when I first came upon this, upon this work, which is in 1927, this professor Ivan Wallen from Colorado, as you'll notice down here, the University of Colorado, um, he writes in a, in a book that compiles his work, it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. And this is because Wallen, first of all, discovered that mitochondria are bacteria. In fact, he, he thought they were bacteria. They weren't bacteria derived. They were just straight up bacteria based on their binary fission inside cells. And he reasoned that if these bacteria or mitochondria are common throughout fauna and flora, then they may represent some fundamental soup or ingredient for evolutionary change leading to new species. Of course, we wouldn't go this far as today to say that they represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. They do represent a factor as speciation is multifaceted. But I, in my view, Wallen gets, um, gets a deserving amount of credit for setting the stage. What happened to Wallen? Why don't we talk about him in evolutionary biology courses uh, or the history of biology? Well, his work was somewhat trumped by H.J. Muller, who really founded the field of genetics um, with his mutation experiments. And this, of course, happened in the same year that Wallen published his Origin of Species book, Symbiontis and New World Species. And so genetics really took off from that point on. Um, and I would say that the early periods of studying the origin of species were both eukaryocentric, uh, focusing on large fauna and flora, and then nucleocentric with the modern synthesis then developing afterwards. Thomas Hunt Morgan, a famous fly geneticist, went as far as to say back then, in a word, the cytoplasm can be ignored genetically. And if we happen to listen to Morgan at that time, we really wouldn't have any mitochondrial biology or chloroplast genetics uh, to, to work with. And of course, the field developed since then. So what happened? Well, it took many decades uh, in order for the first case of microbes causing speciation to be produced. Um, and this in fact is Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, one of the founders of the modern synthesis. And among his trainees, he had very few female students, but one of them was Lee Ehrman. This is Lee Ehrman. And she published a crucial paper in the 1970s uh, entitled The Microorganismal Basis of Infectious Hybrid Male Sterility. Here we get really the first evidence that a bacteria can cause hybrid sterility, hybrid male sterility, in subspecies of these Drosophila polystorum flies. Uh, she was able to antibiotically cure that male sterility by getting rid of the bacteria. And subsequent work uh, several decades later um, ultimately showed that the bacteria that cause the male sterility are the bacterial symbionts Wolbachia that we'll talk about in a bit more today. Okay. You may, you may know this person, this is Lynn Margulis, uh, a young Lynn Margulis, who spent a lot of time advocating for the role of symbionts in speciation. She was a wonderful synthetic advocate. Um, she didn't produce any experiments or evidence herself, but I think she once again took up the gauntlet and championed this idea, um, in, especially in her, in her books. So today, uh, with the technologies we have and the systems we have, I think there are four 
motivational questions for studying hologenomic speciation. The first two are, do endosymbionts and microbiomes contribute to host speciation? And then if they do, what types of host reproductive isolation do those microbes cause? And here we want to think about pre-mating isolation, such as mating behavior, or post-mating isolation, such as hybrid sterility and inviability. What types are more common if, if there are uh, enrichments in certain types of microbe-assisted reproductive isolation? Uh, I think an important question also to think about is that microbes may slow down the speciation process of their host. So do they tend to accelerate or do they tend to, tend to slow down the host speciation process? And then, of course, from a widespread perspective, you know, is this common across various types of fauna and flora, or is it rare in really special cases of particular host microbe systems? And I would say because we are in the early phases of these questions and, and tools, and systems, we, are, we don't have a good answer to this yet. All right, uh, I started my graduate work thinking about speciation microbes in this particular parasitic wasp, Nasonia again. And there are wonderful advantages to working with this insect model. I would say it's the second best genetic model to, to Drosophila. Um, you're gonna see some mating behavior here of a male chasing a female. Um, they have a metallic green sheen, as you can see, and there's some golden leg and antennas as it zooms in. A lot of wonderful features for working with these Nasonia holobions. Inside the reproductive tissues, if you were to rip them open and stain with a, um, a fluorescent green marker, um, here we have testes. This is one of the ovarials of the ovaries that helps make the eggs um, with the chain beginning here. And then inside the egg, uh, we often, and across the four species of, of Nasonia, find these Wolbachia bacteria. And these are these green punctate signals that have been deposited from uh, the mother's germline stem cell niche, ultimately into the developing oocytes. And then once they leave the wasp, of course, the wasp egg is there, and then it has this cocktail of, of Wolbachia uh, bacterial symbionts. So these are maternally inherited bacteria. In the Sonia, there's also a microbiome. This is a staining for proteobacteria uh, during the pupil stages of the Nasonia. And in this particular stage, the proteobacteria stain is localized to the midgut. Um, and this could be involved in waste processing or waste excretion at this point as the pupae sits relatively dormant uh, in its development. From a geographic distribution perspective, you can kind of get your head around thinking that uh, Many of these species of Nasonia, all four of them are in North America, some are in Europe as well. Uh, they do exist sympatrically in some cases. So in this case, Longicornis and Vitropenis exist sympatrically. Also Vitropenis and Giralti exist sympatrically. And then there's further sympatry with the species Nasonia oneida. For most of this talk, I'm going to use two systems or two species pairs, the younger species pair, which is 400,000 years old between Nasonia geralti and Nasonia longicornis. I may use G or L to shorthand these. And then the million year old species, the older species pair, or at least one of them, Nasonia geralti against Nasonia vitropenis. And so for these, I may use G or V. Now inside the reproductive tissues of all four of these species is a diversity of Wolbachia strains that coexist. Um, as you can see in Nasonia vitropenis, uh, there are two different strains of Wolbachia labeled A and B. They estimated to have been, they, they are, the estimate is that they arose maybe six, 700,000 years ago by horizontal transmission into Nasonia vitropenis. And so therefore the other species don't have these similar strains. There are cases where additional microbes were horizontally transferred in. As you can see, this A infection strain here, which is genetically distinct, distinct from this A infection, um, makes up the Longicornis A strain. And then there are strains that were vertically inherited and co-speciated with their hosts over time. So this was an ancestral B strain, genetically different from this B strain, and ultimately co-diverged with Longicornis and Giralti, as well as Oneida to separate out into specific strains. So there's a mix of horizontal transmission and vertical transmission, the predominant mode of transmission of Wolbachia from mother to offspring. So I wanna re just reflect that diversity. And again, we'll be talking about these older and younger species pairs. So these three species have these you know, sets of Wolbachia strains somewhat divergent from each other. All right, so 
back in the day, a very long time ago, one of the first questions we were asking, motivated by Lynn Margulis's championing of this idea is, do Wolbachia bacteria cause reproductive isolation? And I'll tell you why we were doing that after this slide. This is actually the data, and this is interspecific crosses with Wolbachia infections in each of their respective species. This is the older species pair. Geralti mates with itself, that's compatible. Vitropenis mates with itself, that's compatible. Same for Geralti and Longicornis here in the younger species. But when we make interspecific F1 hybrids or try to, by having the species mate, we observe copulation and then score the number of surviving hybrid offspring. No hybrid offspring in the F1 generation are produced in the older species pair and very few to no are produced in the younger species pair. Now contrast with using Wolbachia free wasps that were able to antibiotically cure the Wolbachia many, many years ago. So they're now living Wolbachia free, but with their resident microbiome. And then we interbreed them again. And look what happens to the hybrid production. It goes markedly up, are markedly up. And in some cases there's hybrid vigor and we get more hybrid survival than even the parentals. So what this indicates is that the presence of the bacteria is severely affecting the ability of F1 hybrids to develop. The species will copulate, but the embryos will die. And Wolbachia has a strong say in that particular process. So yes, the Wolbachia endosymbionts cause reproductive isolation. If we were to continue to measure other types of reproductive isolation and summarize that, um, and I don't want to go through all the details, so this is the summary, you get a picture of the older species pair has lots more hybrid or mating reproductive isolation than the younger species pair does. And of course that makes good sense. Older species have more genetic divergence and therefore will have more reproductive isolation barriers than younger species pair. In the F1 generation, we measured Wolbachia, we measured female inviability, female infertility, uh, and the F1 hybrids are diploid in the haplodiploid system. One of the wonderful advantages of Nisonia is it's haplodiploid, like bees and wasps and ants. And so you can take these F1 hybrid females as virgins, and all virgin haplodiploids lay haploid male eggs that develop into males. So we take those F1 hybrids, we let them lay as virgins, and we get all these F2 recombinant hybrid genotypes between the two species genomes that hybridize. And this is really a case where you'd expect a lot of reproductive isolation to express itself in the haploid state where all recessive problems would arise. And indeed, we see hybrid male inviability in the F2 generation, male behavioral sterility. Um, and then we even see some mate discrimination as well. I want you to keep an eye on this male inviability in the F2 generation. We're gonna come back to that in detail uh, in a little while. So here's a summary of how to put together the Wolbachia uh, uh, reproductive isolation. You can imagine that in Nisonia and in any system, there's a correlation, positive correlation between genetic divergence in the genome and then total reproductive isolation. And at some point on a scale of zero to one with zero, no isolation, and one with complete isolation and therefore species status, um, the, species, the reproductive isolation is complete enough that the species don't interbreed. The older species pair really lines up over here. There's a lot of reproductive isolation and they are uh, essentially um, almost completely void of interbreeding, at least in laboratory measurements. Now in the younger species pair, in, independent of Wolbachia, we'd see moderate levels of reproductive isolation. They'd follow this hypothetical curve. But once Wolbachia came into the system, you could imagine its effect is the bacteria are pushing the species status faster than, let's say, the, the timeline for which it would normally speciate under this older species type model. So symbionts, because they horizontally transfer in, can accelerate the phenotypic outcomes, including reproductive isolation, which is happening um, in the Geralti and Longicornis case. There's some nuclear-based isolation, and then there's also a strong Wolbachia-based isolation that, um, that occurs in the F1 hybrids. This is not a unique phenomena to Nisonia. There are cases, um, including from field samples from these mushroom feeding Drosophila, Drosophila recens and Drosophila subcornaria, where they mapped out the distribution. There's a hybrid zone um, just above the United States and Canada, and these two species attempt to interbreed, but there's this marked number of isolation barriers, including Wolbachia 
causing the F1 hybrid inviability again, and additional mate discrimination barriers that ultimately seal off gene flow between these two mushroom feeding Drosophila species. There are nascent developed and well-developed cases uh, throughout the arthropod world. I've just listed several of them here, and I think there are more coming in which we'll have an expanded number of wolbachia assisted uh, reproductive isolation systems um, with one of the more recent ones in the literature involving these incarcia wasps. And in this case, it wasn't wolbachia that caused the problem. It's an additional symbiont known as cardinium that does very similar things to reproduction of their, of their insect host. All right, so with that, um, I wanna move now from Wolbachia endosymbionts to a, a longer and more evidence-based story on the gut microbiome of Nisonia. And these are, again, are Wolbachia-free wasps, so we can interbreed them and study the problems beyond Wolbachia because Wolbachia aren't present. And in that older species pair that's about a million years old, F1 hybrids are produced. We get this heterozygous diploid state but as I mentioned to focus on, there's this strong F2 male hybrid and viability in, that, in the F2 generation of these recombinant males. And 90% of them die. And it looks something like this. If you were to crack open these puperium hosts of Nisonia, here's Vitropenis and here's Geralti. What you're looking at are yellow Nisonia pupae. They're not quite adults yet. They got red eyes, yellow bodies. Um, the carcass of their fly host is minimal. It's kind of left over and dried up. But in the F2 hybrids, because so many of these hybrids die, um, we see much fewer offspring. We see suspended development in the larval stage. And you see this almost flesh-like material, which is the fly host that wasn't consumed because there were too few uh, hybrids that survived in order to consume that fly host. So uh, on a data sense, it looks like this. If you were to interbreed these two species, um, and in both cross directions, the hybrids uh, will show about an 80 to 90% reduction. And most of them are dying during the larval stages, the third instar larva. Uh, the hybrids, if you look closer, have this extreme melanization response. They're dark and they're secreting lots of melanin. And melanin in insects uh, is used to encapsulate pathogens. Whereas in the non-hybrid, we see a, a non-melanized normal looking larvae. So I added this question up here. We have the phenomenon of hybrid inviability, but does the microbiome contribute? Because we have this melanin production, it might suggest there's an imbalance in the holobiont between the host and the microbiome. And what led credence to that uh, is that we were able to find that the microbiome of these larval hybrids is distinct from the microbiome of the non-hybrids. Um, so in the Vitropenis and Geralti older species pair, their microbiome is dominated by Providencia, which is a proteobacteria, not too distantly related from E. coli. And then there are many small rare microbe variants. But in the hybrids, we see a fundamental switch where proteus bacteria that are rare in the, in the no normal non-hybrid microbiome become much more dominant. Um, and this is uh, uh, potentially indicative of a microbe that's taken over and is uh, possibly launching the immune system and assisting this hybrid death. So in order to get at this question of, does the microbiome contribute? We first developed a germ-free rearing system for these parasitoid wasps. And that was no small feat because these wasps rely on fly host. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph. The wasp lays its eggs right on top of the skin here underneath the pupil casing. They develop into larvae and then pupae. So the question is, is how do you develop a germ-free system when you've got two animals to work with? And what we did is we synthetically made germ-free fly hemolymph, which is essentially macerating up this fly, um, sterilizing its hemolymph fluids, putting it into a trans well where there's a filter basket now sitting on top of this trans well. And we collect embryos of the freshly laid wasp, the wasps. We sterilize the surface of those embryos and put them on the filter. And the embryos will then develop into larvae and they start feeding off of this meniscus layer of the filter and consume the fly hemolymph. And they will develop into pupae quite regularly. Uh, we do see declines in viability into adulthood. About 30% make it all the way to adulthood. But the key is, is that because the larval stages are where we want to study this reproductive isolation, where the melanization happens, we have a good assay for moving from eggs to a, through the larval stages to pupae stages. And so we use this to, 
um, study the role of the microbiome in causing this phenotype. And so when we look at this again, Proteus versus Providencia, if the microbiome is causing the hybrid death, then once we remove the microbiome in the germ-free system, we should expect to see an increase in viability of the hybrids. And that's what we see. They uh, essentially come back to life in this Frankenstein moment where hybrids that should die now live just because they don't have a microbiome. And then if we were to inoculate in certain types of microbes like Proteus and Providencia, a mixture of one to one is what we're showing here, you can reconstitute a certain fraction of that microbiome induced hybrid inviability that normally occurs inside the, the full system of the puparium and their hosts and the fly host. Okay, so the microbiome has a say now in causing the uh, F2 hybrid inviability that we see here. And perhaps there's a link between the melanization response and the role of the microbes assisting in that, in that response. Now, just as a control, we took the younger species pair. So this diverged about 400,000 years ago. They don't show any F2 hybrid inviability, they live. And so that's what this data shows here, whether you're conventionally rearing them or you're germ-free rearing them, viability of the F2 hybrid males in the control species is quite strong. So they lack this isolation barrier and there's no influence of the microbiome. All right. So with the expansion of Proteus and the hybrids, we've recently become interested in characterizing those, those, those dynamics a little bit more. Um, with the question being sort of, does, does the Proteus bacteria outcompete Providencia in the hybrids? Um, so the first thing uh, we did is we cultivated microbes right at this larval three stage, right before hybrid death. So sort of in between um, when the hybrids look normal and then when they melanize, just before that, we cultivated the microbes out. Um, and what we're showing here are two different species of, of bacteria. These are the Proteus and the Providencia. And you can see this Proteus um, cylindrical ring structure here and the Providencia just looks like normal colonies on a plate. Uh, and that's because Proteus has a swarming behavior that pauses and starts and pauses and starts. And so what you get are these uh, cylindrical rings of when there's a swarming event and a pause and a swarming event and a pause. Uh, we went ahead and characterized these bacterial growth parameters in a biofilm assay in a micro titer wall plate where you just ask, uh, can the bacteria essentially grow on the walls of the micro wells and form a biofilm? And both do, Proteus does it a little bit better than Providencia. And then when you co-culture them together, there's a modest slight uptick in the, the amount of biofilm here, but it's very similar to Proteus. And so we had a question now of, well, does the Proteus bacteria uh, and Providencia bacteria equally form this biofilm in the co-culture or is one contributing uh, to, to that biofilm? So here we quantified the cells with a qPCR assay uh, and show that this is on an order of magnitude scale that the Proteus bacteria indeed represent about 95% of the cells in the biofilm assay here relative to the Providencia bacteria. Uh, so this co-culture assay confirmed that the Proteus are outcompeting uh, out competing the Providencia, which in a test tube or in a well like this mimics what's happening uh, in the actual wasp host. Uh, because we were able to culture these bacteria out, we then sequenced their genomes, uh, and then we compiled some phylogenomic uh, uh, relationships. And the point I wanted to make here is that both Providencia and Proteus um, have distinct microbes from humans. And one of our questions, because sometimes these bacteria are human associated was, are they just derived from humans and laboratory rearing or are they distinct? Um, and they do form well-resolved separate clades. And so the bacteria in Nisonia as well as flies are distinct from the human lineages in both cases. This is a little bit more about the pan genome analysis of uh, the Proteus bacteria now. So this is the Proteus species core, and there's a lot that's similar in terms of the gene functional categories, but there's a lot that's different as well between the human lineages in blue and the wasps in red. In the Sonia or the wasp, there's ninefold more gene clusters enriched in cell wall and membrane biogen biogenesis. Um, and so this is, you might think of this as LPS lipopolysaccharide synthesis, lipopolysaccharide modifications, sugar structures in the cell walls, all of these could be surface exposed on the membrane and essentially uh, be involved in immune evasion or potentially even phage sensitivity protection as these have been shown to be involved in. Um, uramidase is often used in proteus bacteria for swarming. 
And so it's interesting that this is upregulated in these swarming bacteria in this onion. On the human side, there's more mobile elements. And there's also more gene clusters involved in nutrient scavenging, particularly uh, for metals, um, including copper, uh, receptors for iron and siderophore biosynthesis. All right. So as I mentioned, the proteus bacteria are common in the hybrids and they're rare in the non-hybrids. And one question that's obvious then is, is the bacteria present in the hybrids the same that are present in the non-hybrids? And so there's essentially an expansion or release of these proteus bacteria in the hybrids. And so when we go ahead and compare the pan genomes of the hybrid Nisonia versus the non-hybrid Nisonia, so hybrids versus the pure species, the pan genomes are essentially almost identical. Uh, and so I think it's reasonable to conclude, even though there's some slight variation probably due to genome assembly issues, there's no consistent pattern that distinguishes hybrid proteus from non-hybrid proteus. And that sort of fulfills a tenet of there is the same microbe in parents is causing hybrid lethality uh, in the hybrids. All right, so that's the microbe side. What about the host side of this, of this F2 hybrid lethality? Does the host contribute to the problem? In here, we also measured transcriptomes of hybrids that were germ-free versus inoculated with bacteria versus conventionally reared. And so these with bacteria die, these without bacteria live, and you can kind of get a sense that there's an expression signal here where there's a lower immune gene expression in the germ-free organisms versus the inoculated and conventional hybrids that die. And so if we quantitatively just put that on a chart, this is just immune gene expression relative to the rest of the genome. And really what this tells us is that germ-free organisms are underexpressing their immune system because obviously there's no microbe there, uh, whereas conventional and reinstated microbiomes will launch essentially a, a, an increased immune response that correlates with the hybrid inviability, the hybrid death problem, whereas lowering the immune system uh, in the absence of the microbiome lowers the hybrid inviability. Interestingly, there's been a large long-term focus over many decades on the genetic factors in the, in the Nasonia wasp genome that control the hybrid lethality. So these are five chromosomes and these are four molecular markers that associate with hybrid death relative to non-hybrid death and viability. Um, so these are large QTL regions. There's no exquisite resolution here on the specific genes. Uh, but they have been mapped. And it allows us to then use these genetic regions to proxy whether these genetic regions would be influenced by the microbiome-assisted hybrid lethality. And the way we went about that is we measured essentially what's called the marker ratio transmission distortions. So when there's hybrid lethality in the F2 males, um, the Mendelian ex expectation is that you would get 50% from vitropenis and 50% from Geralti, that would be normal segregation of the two parental species alleles. But under hybrid lethality, there's a bias in the Mendelian expectations. And we get more vitropenis alleles in the hybrids, um, uh, or the hybrids that don't die versus the hybrids that do die. So hybrids die, and then there's a bias of the, the, those hybrids that survive, and the hybrids that survive tend to have more vitropenis uh, allele frequency, higher allele frequencies. However, when we remove the microbiome, this was sort of the window of opportunity to say, well, once you get rid of the microbiome and there's no hybrid lethality, the expectation is that these markers would be restored to 50-50 Mendelian sex ratios. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happens. So perhaps something, some genes in these regions interact with the microbiome in order to drive these, these mismatches in the hybrids that cause lethality. Okay, so from, from my perspective, we, you could really compare this to uh, just a nuclear-centric model versus a model that includes nuclear loci and the microbes. And when you do that, you start to think about what are the possibilities for expanding the ways that the whole genome contributes to reproductive isolation. So in a three-locus model with an ancestral population and you have loci A, B, and C with divergence over time, um, ultimately, you can do the modeling and show that the divergent alleles, the derived alleles, the big A that evolved from the little a, the big B that evolved from the little b, these can negatively interact where the red arrows are in a way that drive negative intergenetic, intergenetic interactions that cause hybrid problems. If you simply take out the C allele and put a microbe with the ability for it to diverge, 
and the ability of it for to horizontal transfer and the ability of it for to expand its replication. Ultimately, and I'm not gonna go into the details, essentially you get a doubling of the number of red arrows here, uh, conditions and the doubling of the possible number of hybrid incompatibilities. So my expectation is that host microbiome interactions driving hybrid problems will be far more common than currently estimated or appreciated because most reproductive isolation biologists think about nuclear genetics or cytoplasmic nuclear genetics, whereas the microbes don't get ever treated in, let's say, a germ-free assay that would allow us to resolve some of these roles here. So I think we're going to find a lot of cases, a lot more cases. Uh, so far, we have a, couple, a handful, a little bit more than a handful of cases across the animal kingdom, not covering plants here, where uh, anything from invertebrates to vertebrates show altered microbiomes or metabolomes that sometimes correlate with hybrid sterility, hybrid inviability, or hybrid pathologies. Um, so already, I think we're starting to see that the Nasonia case will be uh, one of many cases across many different systems where we can understand this a little bit more. All right. So I'm going to wrap up on the concept now. You can kind of see where we're going, which is, you know, how to host, how does host evolution change with microbial communities over time that may lead to these sorts of hybrid problems? Um, and one of the ways we've been thinking about that is if you were to measure the evolutionary phylogeny of a host, in this case, some insects, and compare that to the ecological community relationships of the microbiome, you might see that there's topological congruency between host evolution and microbiome community relationships. And this is a pattern that we call phylosymbiosis and others have called it and use it. There's other statistics that can, that can also evaluate the correlation between host evolution and microbial ecology uh, changes um, with respect to their host evolution. So we uh, initially wanted to know, this was in Nisonia, and we wanted to know how common it is. Um, so we ended up using both vertebrate and invertebrate systems from mosquito female pupae to deer mice, female feces to look at their gut microbiomes to Drosophila females. We also used a data set on, um, on primate microbiomes just to reevaluate that with our tools. And then we expanded our phylosymbiosis work into Nisonia females. So 24 species in total, spanning a range of divergence between 0 0.2 and 108 million years of evolution. In our lab, we uh, tend to exquisitely control our, our experiments uh, because we wanna know once we remove the variables of age, diet, and gender, do we eliminate the phylosymbiosis signal or do we actually find it? Um, and then we can think about how those results in the lab correlate back out to nature where phylosymbiosis uh, is also increasingly common. So what you're looking at here are these dendrogram analyses and various statistics that I won't get into the details about, but what I want you to focus on is wherever there's a matching line between the host species and the microbiota or microbiome, that indicates a match, an evolutionary match to the host micro to the microbe ecology in that host. So in Nisonia, there's a perfect match, right? That is perfect phylosymbiosis. In the mice, um, there's several species, or I should say one species, that debunks the trend, but the other several ones, five, show phylosymbiosis. Uh, primates show good amounts of phylosymbiosis with the exception of one species. Mosquito pupae did as well, and even Drosophila did, but Drosophila has the weakest phylosymbiotic signal that we could detect in our data set. And there's certainly variable amounts of evidence on whether that exists uh, in other people's studies. So this led us to, to, to suggest that phylosymbiosis will be common, um, especially under these controlled conditions that otherwise you know, might have eliminated the variation. Instead, we start to see it um, and excavate it a bit with these controlled conditions. Again, the range of evolution here from ho the host side is quite variable. So there's no Goldilocks zone of where you see phylosymbiosis and where you don't. Whether you're looking at a clade that's a million years old or a clade that represents 108 million years of evolution, phylosymbiosis exists. So we haven't found the threshold yet of where it breaks down. And if we use um, computational modeling, uh, random forest to predict what microbiome belongs to what species within each of these clades, what I'm showing you here is the accuracy of those predictors. So for Nisonia, we can take a microbiome from any Nisonia and say, all right, there's 89% accuracy that we can predict the host just based on their microbiome. In mosquitoes, it's even stronger. And in flies, it's still quite strong. 
Uh, you can see in the vertebrate species where there's marked amounts of more complexity in the microbiome, the predictors don't do as well, but there's still more than chance, still more than chance, because if you have six species, chance would be one out of six, not uh, more than half. So there's some predictive power still in the, in the vertebrate microbiomes. Um, even though there's no timeline restriction, um, it's still evident that there's a correlation between the divergence age of the host clade and the strength of the interspecific microbiota distinguishability. This just means that there are, of course, more closely related microbiomes among the younger species clade than in the older species clade. And this really strong correlation, although it's only on a few samples, um, was, was quite revealing to us that host age um, has a marked influence on the degree of differentiation across different uh, animal taxa. And this has been expanded upon in several other systems. For anybody that wants to learn a bit more about phylosymbiosis, a uh, former postdoc and I just published a paper in Proceedings of the Royal Society called An Introduction to Phylosymbiosis, where we summarized to some of the state of knowledge um, across lab environments, across wild environments, across skin, across intestines, across skeletons, guts, feathers. Um, there's a wide diversity of this phylosymbiotic pattern. Um, is it a bona fide trend that the microbiome field can uh, sink their teeth into? Yes. Is it universal? No. Some species don't show it. Um, but it's nice that evolution's contributing sort of a bona fide trend to the microbiome field as the base of the uh, biological sciences. All right, I'm going to start to wrap up with just answering the question that might be on some of your minds. Once you find a pattern like phylosymbiosis, what does it mean? Is it consequential or not? And the way we're evaluating that is if you take something like the Nisonia species pairs again, of course, they arose, they split a million years ago, they diverged, and then they speciated completely. They have different microbiomes, and I should clarify at this point, the microbiomes could be acquired from the environment differently, or they could be vertically inherited. It doesn't matter. They just have these different microbiomes. And when we swap them, in the larval state, which is going to be our experimental assay, we're swapping the larval microbiome from one species into the other species. This essentially allows us to ask, is there a cost to getting a different microbiome? Much in the same way that if you were studying mitochondrial fitness effects, you might take a mitochondrial genome, integress it into a different species, and ask, does the mitochondria from one species have a fitness cost on another? So that's what we did in uh, the Nasonia complex. And to make a long story short, we measured larvae, larval biology with and without their own microbiomes over the course of metamorphosis. And what we find is that there's a 20% reduction in larval size, a 43% reduction in the rate of pupation, which translates then into a 43% reduction in survival. So this is for the older species pair um, in which there's a significant cost to having the wrong microbiome uh, introduced into that system. Um, and so in an evolutionary informed way, the microbiome poses cost to, host species, to the to recipient hosts. The microbiome poses cost to the recipient host in an evolutionary informed way, where the with one self microbiome has the highest survival, a species that's a little more different has an intermediate level of survival, and then a species with a very different microbiome ultimately causes the lowest survival in that recipient host species. So this suggests then that natural selection maybe fine tuning the host and the microbiome to function in an allied way uh, that gives us these differential outcomes when there's a mismatch between the microbiome and the host expects a certain microbiome. Okay, so I'm gonna start to wrap up at this point, kind of summarize our illustrative findings. Um, we spent a good chunk of uh, time on phylosymbiosis and the functional consequences. Um, and, and you can kind of get the sense of why we think about the individual Nisonia now is really this complex holobiont. And the microbes matter as much to understanding fitness and to understanding reproductive isolation as just thinking about this as an individual. And again, I don't argue that this is new to symbiosis biologists, but it does offer a wider lens and concept for other fields to think about host microbiome complexity. When we make F1 hybrids, especially in the older species pair, these die. And they die because of Wolbachia-induced uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility. I didn't talk about the mechanism here, but this is what's causing the F1 hybrid death. And then if we were to cure the Wolbachia and allow these F1 hybrids to live, the F2 recombinant male hybrids also die 
and they're dying because of a host by gut microbiome interaction problem. So there's a cascading set of effects of microbes, bacteria on the Sonia reproductive isolation. And in, in the grand scheme of things, one has to wonder, is Nasonia just a special case in biology, or is it really that we're going to see other systems find similar kinds of cascading effects of the microbes on reproductive isolation? And of course, we're already seeing some of that data that we highlighted uh, earlier in the talk. All right. And I think go, pulling the camera back even wider to end on a big concept note, I just want to bring back this concept that you know, since Darwin and the Origin of Species, the early days of, of the Origin of Species was eukaryocentric on fauna and flora. That's what Darwin mostly talked about. He was, he had a sterile Origin of Species, as some like to say, uh, in which he really didn't talk about bacteria and microbes. The 20th century really brought a nucleocentric view of thinking about modern synthesis and merging evolutionary biology with genetics. And Arguably, some of us think that the last decade is bringing in a new revolution of holism, where we're looking at the host microbiome systems together and these integrative interactions that influence the biology of not just the individual, but of the, of the whole community that it represents. So from Wallen's pioneering ideas to the modern synthesis, ultimately to Dobzhansky student giving us the first case of microbes causing speciation, there's a rich history now developing of, of this field and moving forward, I think we're in a great time uh, to push it much farther than, than we are right now. So this is the crew that contributed to the work from undergraduates to uh, former graduate students, postdocs, and then now professors. Um, Aram's a professor at North Carolina State University. Uh, Andy Brooks, who did a lot of the phylosymbiosis work is a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, Kevin was a postdoc who did a lot of phylosymbiosis work. He's at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Teddy did a lot of phylosymbiosis work in the Sony. He's at the AAAS and our, our current crew here at Vanderbilt right now. Um, so thanks for listening. And I will leave it there and maybe pull down my screen and see y'all and we'll take some questions. Thank you, thank you. I can see all your claps. So, Abby, can you read the questions or maybe I, I am. There are no questions in the chat yet. If you all have questions, put them in the chat and then we'll. OK, so Lauren has a question. Go ahead, Lauren. OK, um, so for starters, I'm a, an intro to evolution um, student in Dr. Mina Balgopal's class. Yeah. I'm an undergraduate and you're talking about a lot of things that we've been going over this semester with like the fight we actually read a paper about phylosymbiosis and things like that and Great. when you were talking about the uh, like the hybrid um sorry I'm really nervous talking in front of all of you guys because you're very <laughs> intelligent people but um no we're just older that's all we know a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you were talking about like the the hybrids be having like that be lethal when um, you were talking about like there being a lethality, but like so with the sorry, I gotta calm myself down. Um, with oh, you're like doing the, great. Go for it. Okay, so with the presence of the bacteria affecting like that gene flow barrier, are you seeing it like? Would you like, is that suggesting that it's going to lead towards a fixation towards, because like we talk about like, um, mm -hmm. it's a great so, question. Yeah. So, we, so would you see, is it, I guess essentially, is it like kind of driving like an artificial selection by like killing off the hybrid species? Yeah. The way, the way I think about this is, uh, so you have different genetic changes in the Nasonia, and you have microbiome changes in the Nasonia. And as those genetic and microbiome changes become sufficient enough, they ultimately could lead to the lack of interbreeding. So at some ancestral state, there's so few changes that the species are compatible, they make viable hybrids, etc. But then as they diverge, um, the, abil the ability for the genome systems and the microbiome systems to work together can ultimately create a hybrid problem in which these hybrids no longer uh, exist. So, or they can't be, they're not viable. As a result, it's not a matter of the hybrid problem spreading or being selected upon. It's more a matter of what happened in the course of the evolution of those species 
that then keeps them separated because they can't produce viable hybrids anymore. And so what we're doing is we're coming in at the end of the process and we're saying, okay, having diverged for a million years, what is the range of reproductive isolation problems that will continue to prevent these species from interbreeding? And so in one case, we have the Wolbachia, in the other case, we have the gut microbiome. Okay. So this will continue to drive the wedge, right? And keep these species apart over the long term. Okay. Cause like one of the things that we talk about is heterozygote superiority and yep. like how greater variation uh, over time, you know what I mean? Yep. So when you take away that heter, like, you know, the heterozygotes or the hybrids, if you will. So you're talking about them actually diverging because you have like if we're talking, we'll put it in like recessive and dominant, you have like these recessive and dominant um, like species like that become so different that they can no longer interact. That's what you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so and so maybe early in a divergence event where there's so few changes, hybrids can be made and they're more vigorous and they get this hybrid vigor effect, right? But once there's enough genetic change within the species, those uh, adaptations, those genetic changes, once they're combined into a hybrid, are so different from where they normally evolved that they can't produce the right molecular phenotypes, consequences, protein-protein interactions. And so no longer do the genome system work together and you get these hybrid problems as a result. Yeah. Thanks That's for your question. Thank you. Next up, Paul Odie has a question. Yeah, that was a very nice talk, Seth. I really appreciated that. Um, I, uh, I guess my, my question is primarily uh, trying to relate uh, differences in mating behaviors, particularly of males of these different species. I know, and I'm trying to remember, well, I don't remember much of the details about the, the different species, but I do seem to remember that some mate even within the host before females emerge, and then others engage in fighting, and some are wingless, others are winged. And so they, it seems like a lot of these species have their own behavioral mechanisms of, of, of really limiting the amount of, of hybridization. And I was wondering if you could comment about, you know, how does that map on top of the, you know, the older species pair differences versus the more recent species pair differences and whether or not, uh, well, I guess, how, how often do you think or do you see hybridization occurring out in the field or out in nature? I love this question and I'd love that you know about Nasonia mating behavior. That's great. Um, so the older species pair, right, has this accumulation of different reproductive isolation barriers. And you're absolutely right that inside the host, when before the wasps emerge out as adults, they actually exist as adults inside the host. And I'm explaining this for everybody else. And inside that host, the Giraldi species will mate with itself. And inside the Vitropenis host, the Vitropenis won't mate. They'll wait to mate after they emerge out of the host. Um, so that can provide a level of pre-mating isolation that on top of the hybridization keeps the species apart. However, Giraldi and Vitropenis, although they have these different mating strategies, can parasitize the same host and they can begin to mate with each other inside that host. And so the uh, within host mating is not a complete barrier to gene exchange. They may end up producing some hybrids because of that. Uh, in terms of the younger species pair, that's a good question. I, don't, I haven't seen a ton of work on within host mating um, for the younger species pairs. And so I can't quite fill in the gaps on that. But I would say that at least uh, they breed in the lab readily and there's very few hybrid problems except for Wolbachia. So, uh, so there's a little bit of mate discrimination that we know when we put a male and female in a tube together, the younger species pair discriminates a little bit. Generally they mate, generally the most severe isolation is Wolbachia. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Ariel Belk has a question. Hello, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I've been thinking a lot, even though it's insects in general are completely outside my field, I've been thinking about them a lot lately because of some papers we read in the class. Um, Great. And I, and I guess um, you might have kind of answered this and I lost track a little bit, but how, like why if um, these Wolbachia have become such important like drivers of this speciation, why do they persist in the community? You know, if like, they lead to such negative consequences. Like why, and I guess also how. Yeah, 
I, sh I should have had a slide as I was going through the talk. I was thinking I should have had a slide on why Wolbachia causes incompatibility. I think I did, and I took it out. Um, essentially, Wolbachia are what, what are called reproductive parasites. And so they modify insect reproduction to spread themselves maternally from mother to offspring every generation. And one of the ways they do the, the parasitism is they cause a, a sperm egg incompatibility. And so imagine an infected male with one strain of Wolbachia and an infected female with a different strain of Wolbachia. The different strains of Wolbachia encrypt the sperm and egg so that they can't combine properly after fertilization and form a normal first mitosis. And that leads to the Wolbachia induced F1 hybrid problem. When we strip them of their Wolbachia, the sperm and egg are no longer molecularly encrypted and ultimately that, that produces a normal first mitosis. Now that doesn't explain why Wolbachia do this. They do it in the first place because within one species, an infected male mates with an uninfected female all offspring die. But if the female is infected, she will nullify that embryonic problem and allow the infected male to essentially reproduce with her. What does that do? Well, it means that infected moms reproduce and uninfected moms don't. And that's the drive mechanism that spills out into this reproductive isolation mechanism over evolutionary time. Wow, thank you. Yeah, it's super fascinating that the bacteria get to play with sexual lives of their animal hosts in such profound ways. Is there anything else that they do for the organism besides just persist because of selection? In so there's an expanding set of studies on, um, on phenotypes that, that are beneficial. Uh, and in some systems, they've shown that Wolbachia can block RNA pathogens, RNA viruses, uh, insect viruses, as well as viruses that, that get transmitted from insects to us, including Zika and Dengue. And so this has become a major application tool. Uh, I'm sure there are other benefits. In some cases, they mildly increase fecundity. In other cases, they mildly decrease fecundity. So this gets a little bit more nuanced, but it's uh, the most sort of uh, attention. And I think why we see Wolbachia to be so widespread uh, is because they're very effective at changing reproduction for their own advantage. And then there are these secondary effects that we see as well. Great, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Dan, do you want to go ahead with your question? Sure. Thanks, Seth. Uh, you know, really enjoyed that. And uh, especially the, the introduction on, on Wallen. I think I'm one of the, uh, the people that, uh, missed out and and had Mueller uh, swamp I knew I knew well and of you know uh, you know sort of extending endosymbiotic theory to mitochondria but I didn't know about his sort of contributions to thoughts on on speciation yeah that's um, great. yeah yeah that's that, that was interesting stuff and and so it, it, your comment about how we don't think you know bacteria and, and mitochondria are at the the heart uh, of, of speciation made me think of some people who advance pretty, uh, you know, provocative ideas about mitonuclear interactions being, you know, really dominant drivers of speciation. Um, and Nisoni, of course, I mean, Nisoni has it all That's here, right? right? Because it's, it, <laughs> I also think of it as one of the mitonuclear, uh, uh, you know, early systems that people are interested in. That's right. So with all this stuff, mitonuclear, nuclear, nuclear, uh, gut microbiome, Wolbachia, uh, I mean, do you have an overall sense of the relative contributions of those? Like, which are the big ones and which are more sort of uh, uh, low variance contributors uh, in this particular system? Yeah, I, you really categorized it very well. And I would say that we, don't, we haven't put a prescription on importance yet only because we don't have a ton of cases of, um, of you know, microbiome induced changes or and maybe you could tell me more, but I, my understanding from the speciation literature is a lot more focused on nuclear genetics than cytonuclear genetics and correct me if I'm wrong there. And so we tend to have this convention that the nuclear genome uh, is the stuff of speciation, except for the people who actually study these things. And here we are talking about why they're important. In terms of the relative importance within Nisonia, uh, the case of Nisonia sort of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with Paul, which is there can be mating isolation that prevents the species from interbreeding between the older species pair. That can be quite strong, but not perfect. In the younger species pairs, they don't have that strong mating isolation. In both species pairs, the next thing that hits them is Wolbachia, because once the sperm and egg combine, Wolbachia is permanent, it's there, it's vertically inherited, and it's causing the cytoplasmic sperm egg incompatibility. Uh, and so uh, my personal view on all of this is while there's an accumulation of isolation barriers from mating to post-mating, um, Wolbachia across the 
evolutionary time here seems to have had a bigger influence on other isolation barriers. Um, and I, I don't think that's the end all to be all, but that's how we see it right now. Cool, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Go Wolbachia, I guess. Um, Lauren has one more question. If you need to go, Seth, we're over time, but it's um, if you no, have time going. to take another question from Lauren, she's got another one. I'd love to. Okay, sorry. So um, you were talking about the hybrid problem and like the phyllosymbiosis. So are you um, seeing a similar hybrid problem to um, like in between similar taxa or is this kind of like a more widespread problem where you're seeing this kind of like lethal hybrid problem or like you called it um like the male invariability like in viability yeah in vi sorry in viability yeah. are you seeing this against like in broader taxic taxonomic groups or are you just seeing it in things that are closely related to the nisonia no that's a great question and uh one of the study systems that came a couple of years after our nisonia story was a mouse um, uh, a house mice and they had subspecies of house mice from europe that interbreed. And, and what they showed was that the hybrid house mice had uh, a proliferation of an altered microbiome of more pathogens and more gut pathology in the hybrid uh, gut intestines of these mice. Um, and in our sleuthing of the literature, we have about eight cases now spanning Drosophila mites, Nasonia, mice, horses, uh, and a couple other systems in there that also show hybrid changes in the microbiome. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg uh, because not a lot of people are studying this, especially relative to cytonuclear and nuclear nuclear interactions. So uh, I'm excited about having speciation biologists and evolution biologists think about their hybrid systems a bit more and bringing these types of questions to their systems so we can get a better sense of how common this is. So even if it's not necessarily lethal it may be causing like non-adaptive traits yeah. to occur within different that's interesting yeah, like a reduction in fitness or performance because right. the pathology is enhanced for example right um, and then sterility happens as well the microbes can proliferate and cause sterility as, as much as they cause inviability um, so it's kind of a tragedy of the comments when you've got all these genetic and microbe players impacting the system and knowing where we are in the evolutionary time of that uh, of that tragedy, and then how, what are the main types of the tragedy is an important question for us to round out and fill the textbook knowledge on. Thank you. That's really cool. Thanks. All right, anybody else have questions for Dr. Bordenstein? Cool, well, thank you everybody. That was a delightful set of questions and answers. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present Abby and Dan, really great meeting y'all today. And uh, if you're ever in Nashville, look us up and we'll get you some famous Nashville hot chicken if you like spicy food. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.